Hello, I'm Michael Tice. I practice osteopathy out here in Winnipeg, Canada. And in this video, I'm going to introduce you to my thesis research titled Andrew Taylor Still's Conception of Immunity, Its Essence and Application. So this research was conducted from 2016 to April of 2020, when it suddenly became all the more relevant. And from the very outset here, I'd like to emphasize this is an introduction. Uh, not a synopsis of the research findings. This video is not going to try and represent the full complexity of Still's immuno immunological understanding, uh, nor is it even going to present all of the major findings of the study, but it will include full references in the video description below uh, with hyperlinks to where you can freely and easily view Still's original texts through the Kirksville Museum's archive. There's also chapter links uh, within the video itself if you want to skip ahead. So please understand trying to present uh, Still's full conception of immunity within this video would be akin to trying to present this, like this. There is a lot of important material that's being left out here. For the full findings and a free download of the complete study, see stillnessosteopathy.com slash immunity, uh, where you can also sign up for notification regarding the upcoming on-demand webinar that'll be based on and expanding upon this research. So that being said, this video, for example, is not going to address Still's opinion of vaccination uh, for smallpox, nor the unorthodox substitute for smallpox vaccination that's still innovated using the topical application of a caustic substance derived from beetles, but that is in the paper itself. Nor is this video going to give you a wider context for Still's major pre-osteopathy influences, other than to say that Still was originally trained in the traditional orthodox miasmatic model of disease, this being a theory that still remained a lifelong adherent to and strongly incorporated into his subsequent development of osteopathy. This model held that invisible poisonous gases carry the seeds of disease into a host. If these seeds are to germinate and grow, they need the proper conditions. But we'll come back to that in just a second. Let's start with the title of the study, the word conception. It was chosen very intentionally as this is one word that encompasses two meanings, thereby indicating multiple questions. What was Still's understanding of immunity? How did Still come to that understanding? These questions formed the basis of this study. And I should note, to the best of my knowledge, this is the only study of its kind to date. The purpose of this study was to learn what Still's immunological understanding was, so that we may then best understand how Still practically applied that immunological understanding, so that most importantly, it could then be determined if there are any aspects of Still's immunological understanding that can enhance a modern osteopathic practice. This is to say that the fundamental goal of this study was clinical applicability. That goal was informed by sequential stages of inquiry. Still's conception of immunity was contextualized, first inside his own time and place, then within his personal worldview, and finally in light of the scientific discoveries that have occurred since his death. Each of those contexts yielded a different meaning, and each of those meanings was then analyzed for potential modern clinical applicability. That process of inquiry was formalized into these four research questions, which you can pause and read if you like. Though the research process was cyclic, each question can be roughly understood as being a particular stage of the research process, which I will discuss in just a minute. But first, a little bit of background. In the process of conducting this study, a trend was clearly identified. As the initial literature review was conducted during the proposal, within the later key informant interviews, within the historical and modern osteopathic literature relevant to this topic, in all of these, it became apparent that there is widespread agreement or simply demonstration that Still's conception of immunity has been largely lost, disregarded, and misunderstood by the osteopathic profession from Still's own era continuously up to today. This informed the justification of this study. I feel like this painting is a pretty good synopsis of where things are at in the wider world right now, which is just to say that solutions are urgently required to address a whole host of interrelated issues. If Still's claims regarding osteopathy's immunological utility are true to any significant degree, then a modern revisiting of Still's understanding of immunity would be of extreme value and an appropriate tool to engage with many of today's most pressing concerns, such as, the global pandemic that began in the final weeks of conducting this research, the emergence of multi-drug resistant pathogens and their increasing relevance to modern medical practice, the economic costs of orthodox technological healthcare, 
which therefore make it inaccessible to most of the world's population. And simply the general issue of prevention and resilience in the face of disease, which is not being adequately addressed within that dominant orthodox medical model. I could go on, but as we all know, anxiety and depression suppress immune function. So let's leave it at that for now. Okay, now stick with me for one minute here while we discuss the technical nitty gritty of the research design or just skip ahead. There are timestamp chapters in the description below of this video. But trust me, this video is about to get a whole lot more interesting. So this was primarily a literature based study. This was necessary, obviously, given that we cannot interview Still himself, but we can access the artifacts surrounding his life. And we can do this with more ease than any generation of osteopaths before us. As an important side note here, I've included a link to the Kirksville Museum's archive. It has all of Still's books, all of his articles from the Journal of Osteopathy, the works of the early osteopaths, and so much more. And this is all free for immediate download, no sign up, just go take advantage of it. I think that nowadays we need to realize that many of these texts only became available for the first time ever in the early to mid 1990s, and then only in physical print. So this means that many of your teachers were not able to read these texts when they themselves were students. The link is in the description below this video. Just go check it out. So also incorporated into this study was the modern literature that has been produced since Still's death. This included modern orthodox immunological research, as well as relevant modern osteopathic quantitative studies and related commentary. So much has been learned since Still's death in, inside and outside of the osteopathic tradition. And again, we have more access to this than any previous generation of osteopaths. All of this can then be employed to help us best interpret modern meaning from Still's historical body of work. So in the end, 372 sources of literature were incorporated into this research with 63 of those being texts by Andrew Taylor Still. The basic themes that emerged from that process led to the seeking out of modern individuals who have a specialized knowledge of a particular emergent theme, so-called key informants. In the end, nine key informants from four countries participated in this research. As I mentioned, the study was conducted over the course of four years with 20 formal hours per week being dedicated to it. Data analysis was, was conducted via the editing style, which is a collage-like arrangement of extracts from the literature interwoven with the researcher's own commentary and insights. I found that rewriting Still's texts was very helpful. It gave me a better appreciation for the cadence of his thought, and to a certain degree, it was a literal means of following in his footsteps. At the very least, it forced me to consider every word. The second data analysis method employed in this research was immersion crystallization, which is simply a fancy way of saying that I steadily obsessed over this topic every waking and sleeping moment for four years straight. Just ask my long suffering wife. For example, I kept a notepad beside my bed so that when I woke up at 3 a.m. with a new insight, I could immediately write it down. My morning yoga practice also often spontaneously yielded fresh insights. Then throughout the day as treating patients in my clinic, I constantly tested the accuracy of these new understandings by applying them and then observing the outcomes over time. Which is all to say that though this was qualitative research, it did not take place primarily on a computer screen. As much as possible, this material was engaged with experientially. This is the, was the benefit of a four year research timeline. It gave enough time to learn how to learn and then the process continued for so long that the topic and the researcher each eventually came to shape the other. On a more practical level, this all played out as coding. Coding is a means of producing pattern recognition within a large set of data so that the data may be organized based upon the shared meanings that are identified. This is a picture from my copy of Still's 1902 book, and you can see that I've returned to the text many times with new insights emerging with each cycle of engagement. As a result of this cyclic process, the interrelated set of codes produced a meshwork from which an overarching essence or story then came about. From this story, a narrative account was given, this being the answer or response to each of those four research questions. And now that we've quickly gone over how the st study was constructed and enacted, let's discuss the really interesting parts, the findings. 
So the traditional orthodox miasmatic medical model that I mentioned earlier, this being the one that still was raised inside of and trained within, held that the process of disease was a type of internal rot, an exponential spread of pathological influence from one individual out to others within a community, or from a localized area within one individual's body, spreading outwards, eventually consuming that entire individual. Dandelions. They are invasive and must be stopped, right? The only options are to either cut them out or poison them. At least that's the mainstream cultural narrative. I personally love dandelions and so do the bees in my garden. Yet notice that within a mature forest, no one is poisoning or cutting out the dandelions and yet not a single dandelion can be found. But surely their seeds are continuously carried into the forest on the wind. There are no dandelions in the woods because the soil conditions are not conducive to the existence of dandelions. This is exactly how still viewed the human body as an internal soil that must be kept in the proper condition so that the disease seeds to which we are all constantly exposed do not have the circumstances they require to germinate, take root, mature, and then exponentially reproduce. This internal soil was composed in Still's mind out of what would today be called the interstitial or extracellular space, including the terminal vessels flowing into and out of it. Still referred to this as the fascia, or sometimes he called it the lymphatics. Still's understanding of the structure function dynamics governing this scale was highly prescient and remain accurate even when compared to modern orthodox descriptions of the same. In fact, I would argue that in many regards, and especially in terms of practical application, even now Still's understanding of this domain remains more nuanced and highly developed. So let's jump straight into some Stillian observation and pattern recognition within the world at large. Here is a satellite photo of a mountain range and its associated watersheds, and here is the internal surface of a human's right parietal bone. And this is an aerial photograph of a confluence within a river system. And this is the lambda of a human skull. This is the left temporal and right scapula from the same individual. And this is their left scapula and right anominate. This forensic field guide warns investigators to avoid confusing the left perinatal scapula with the right pars lateralis, that being the occipital developmental segment that composes the right lateral border of the foramen magnum. And on this next slide here, real quick, what bone are we looking at? The innominate? In fact, it's the superior surface of C1, the atlas. It seems everywhere we look within reality, form is composed of this repetition of self-similar forms, repeating again and again on a variety of scales. If our perspective zooms in or it zooms out, eventually we encounter the very same form. The human form is but one more instance of this same phenomenon. Still also recognized this pattern taking place throughout all of reality and wrote about it multiple times. For instance, when he said, in the sky, we have constellations of worlds. In the body, constellations of molecules. In the sky, we have rain clouds. In the body lying alongside the veins are the lymphatics. This analogy may be carried out indefinitely. So is this all just interesting? Or is it a signpost pointing towards an essential meaning that may then powerfully inform practical clinical application? still propose that this omnipresence of self-similar coherent organization taking place throughout all of reality was indicative of a fundamental principle being the source of the pattern. Still was proposing that the, the pattern is the many similar effects of a singular cause. This is only one of the reasons why it is so vital to engage with Still's worldview if we are to best comprehend his personal conception of immunity. Still's worldview his understanding of reality in general was what he only later applied in particular to the practice of medicine, eventually referring to this as osteopathy. Still was very clear about the genesis and actual foundation of his osteopathy. For example, when he said, 
How was it then, I am asked, that I thought of osteopathy? I first saw the tracks of God in the snow of time. I followed them. Still's osteopathy was not about bones. This repetition of form taking place on a variety of scales throughout reality can be referred to as the holographic principle. If you take a hologram and rip it in half, each half does not display a portion of the image as you would expect with a photograph, for instance. Rather, with a hologram, each half now displays the whole original image, but as viewed from a particular perspective. Notice that the lower stars are being perceived from different angles. It is important to note that Still is not the only one to come to these conclusions and be convinced of their foundational relevance to human inquiry. For one of many possible examples, take this quote from one of the most important and well-respected physicists of the 20th century, David Bohm. In some sense, man is a microcosm of the universe. Therefore, what man is, is a clue to the universe. It is in fundamental agreement with Still's holographic worldview, where Still said, I see in man a miniature universe. And take these images that have never before been available before our, our modern scientific era. One of these is a slice showing the neurons in a mouse's brain, and the other is a compiled image of a vast expanse of space containing clusters of galaxies. Which of these is the perspective of a microscope, and which of these is the perspective of a telescope? This is not just a striking juxtaposition of images. It's the result of a recent study carried out by an astronomer and a neurologist who as a team conducted a quantitative analysis of the spatial arrangements of the networks of neurons floating inside of their cerebral spinal fluid and of galaxy clusters floating inside the fluidic dark sea of this fluidic sea of dark matter and energy. Many, many other examples could be given an infinite number of examples, in fact. It would seem that reality in general and reality in particular mirror each other. In short, this is how Still conceptualized and experienced reality as a whole, a single phenomenon, a unity manifesting itself as a multiplicity of expressions, much the same as a single tree expresses itself as roots, trunk, branches, leaves, and fruit. Yes, each of these expressions is the tree, but none of them individually is the tree itself. Neither is the sum total of these expressions the tree. Rather, the tree is something other than its expressions. Yet each expression is simultaneously the tree present in that moment as that manifestation. This was the shift in perspective that still traversed in the course of his life from what would be categorized as a monotheistic worldview, wherein a separate divine creator in the past brought into existence a static and unchanging universe, to later in Still's life when he moved into what would now be categorized as a panentheistic worldview, wherein the ultimately unknowable ground of reality is continuously manifesting itself as the universe, yet is not limited to that manifestation. Importantly, this then includes humanity, i.e. when Still says, I see in man a miniature universe. In Still's worldview, the individual and the divine whole are reflections of each other. They're the very same phenomenon, only taking place on different scales. In a number of instances within Still's writing, he is explicit. From his perspective, each human, each of his patients is a branch, a manifestation, of this single sacred unity. Thus, when Still refers to God, he is not referring to the conventional Judeo-Christian deity that he was raised with. Rather, Still is using this term to refer to his subsequent revised definition of the sacred. When Still says God, he points his listeners to that which manifests itself as time and space. This is why Still interchangeably used the terms the infinite, the unknowable, with the term God. With all three terms, Still was referring to the unformed, that which has no character except to contain the potential of all possible characteristics. A discussion such as this is not only valid, but is completely necessary to understanding Still's conception of immunity, 
given that Still's revised definition of God was the foundation of his conception of osteopathy. Take, for example, Still's very first book, his autobiography. This is a book of 460 pages, wherein Still uses the terms the unknowable three times, the infinite 17 times, God 235 times, and these were but some of the terms employed by Still to refer to the divine ground of reality. He had dozens more that are all cataloged within the main body of the study. Now for comparison, in this same book, Still refers to osteopathy 214 times. So this may all be very philosophically or biographically interesting, but make no mistake, it is also much more than that because Still was not just a philosopher, he was also a clinician. Still's osteopathy was the practical application of this worldview. One of the fundamental distinctions between the osteopathic and orthodox medical traditions is that when looking at the human being, the orthodox medical system perceives a series of objects or parts, each of which is then understood via a process of extreme isolation and specialization. Whereas Still's osteopathy perceives the human being as a single integrated unity, an indivisible whole whose complexity must always surpass the human capacity for complete comprehension. Note that these two perspectives, the orthodox and the osteopathic, are both observing the same phenomenon, yet it is the perspective, the worldview itself, that then dictates the therapeutic intervention that is chosen to be enacted. For example, for a very long time, one tradition has felt confident to dissect away the fascia so that the relevant anatomy may be observed, while the other tradition has understood that if an aspect of the whole has been manifested into form, then that form too is integral to the full and normal expression of that whole. We must understand that a medical intervention is an application of the perception, the worldview that precedes it. I suspect that most osteopaths would agree that to lose the distinction between these two worldviews would be to lose the very essence and practice of Still's osteopathy. Yet how is it then that today's osteopathy feels increasingly comfortable falling into complete harmony with the fragmented orthodox medical worldview, not so much when it comes to human anatomy, but to the whole of reality itself? For just as in, in the human body, when the orthodox perspective looks out at the universe, it again only perceives objects, parts that are in isolation, that are assumed to be best understood by observation within imposed isolation. And Still's osteopathy was not just a vision of the human being wherein the unity was acknowledged as the fundamentally relevant characteristic, but rather Still's osteopathy was a vision of all of reality wherein indivisibility, unity, was acknowledged as the fundamentally relevant characteristic. Just as on the scale of immunology, where the self is best understood in, the, in relation to non-self, so too on the largest of possible scales can the individual be best understood in the context of the universal. A truly holistic vision of a human being cannot take place within a larger vision of reality that is itself fragmented. The results are the same on either scale. The findings suggest that today's osteopathic practitioner who wishes to meet or even exceed Still's historical scope of practice, his clinical results, and his ability to innovate in the face of novel problems, such a practitioner would do well to study Still's worldview as a highly relevant and practical subject. Again, it becomes clear that A.T. Still's osteopathy was not about bones. And please accept what I'm about to say here, not as a criticism, but rather as the result of an analysis. If an osteopath is simply asking themselves, which bone is immobile? This is then a very superficial engagement with the full possible depth of Still's osteopathic medical model, which is why such a superficial perspective would then yield comparatively superficial outcomes and such a limited scope of practice. This so if we're going to engage with the full potential of this worldview and bring it into application, it would involve investigating how it is that that undifferentiated formless unity comes to present itself as this appearance of separate individualized phenomena. How is it that these patterns, such as the neuron and the galaxy clusters, 
the watershed and the parietal vascular pathways? How is it that these patterns first emerge and then not only persist, but evolve through time and space? These questions are ones that still fundamentally obsessed over, and he found them to be of fundamental relevance to medical practice. This is to say, what he was inquiring, inqu inquiring into was how do we define a self? How does a self emerge? And how does a self perpetuate and evolve within the context of non-self? Again, if this all sounds rather philosophical and impractical, please note that modern orthodox immunology holds the relationship between self and non-self as the foundational concept of the entire subject. In understanding the processes that form and perpetuate an individual, still drew strongly on the work of the British philosopher Herbert Spencer. Thus still arrived at the conclusion that an individualized life, or as he called it, a being, is best understood as a region of coherently organized motion. That region of coherence exists in relation to the exterior, the non-self. To, main in to maintain internal coherence, the self must continuously evolve the resonance of its internal coherence. It must continuously <clears throat> maintain that resonance in relation to the influence of the exterior, as well, it must take in external motion and transform it into compatibility with the resonance of the interior, while aspects of the interior must also constantly cross that boundary and become non-self in the exterior once again. For a so-called individual to exist, a ceaseless harmonized reciprocal exchange must take place, a balance of inflow and outflow across that boundary. On the level of a biological organism, Examples of inflow would be food, water, and inhaled air, while outflow could be feces, urine, exhaled air, sweat, and heat. So from this viewpoint, a biological individual can be best understood as a process rather than an object. This is to say that adaptation is not something you do, it is what you are. Still had concluded that the same force that initially creates an individual is then the very same force that perpetuates and evolves that individual through time and space via regeneration and protection of internal coherence. This all serves to illustrate that Still saw growth and regeneration, which is to say metabolism, and defense, which is to say immunity. These in Still's mind were but two branches of the very same tree two expressions of the single universal force of spontaneous, appropriate self-organization, that being a modern term that was found to be in perfect symmetry with Still's thinking. Or as, Norbert, as, or as Norbert Wiener, the American mathematician who founded the field of cybernetics put it, our tissues change as we live. The food we eat and the air we breathe become flesh and bone of our bone, and the momentary elements of our flesh and bone pass out of our body every day with our excreta. We are but whirlpools in, an, in a river of ever flowing water. We are not stuff that abides, but patterns that perpetuate themselves. This understanding is in fact the very original origin of the word organism. An organism is an instance of organization. An organism is an organized coherence of motion perpetuated and evolving through time and space. To still, death and disease is not caused by the presence of abnormal disease processes. Rather, it's the natural result of an absence, a lack of appropriate self-organization. Thus, at its essence, Still's medical intervention did not consist of freeing the patient of obstructions or agents of disease not even of normalizing their anatomy and physiology. Rather, Still's deepest and broadest therapeutic intention was simply to provide the universal force of self-organization with an unimpeded field in which it might act. Still was not a master of dictating the outcomes of his intervention. Rather, Still possessed an utmost trust in the wisdom for the patient's own inherent capacity for perfectly appropriate adaptation of self-expression. This is what Still's philosophical medical model was founded upon. Still's osteopathy sought to facilitate the restoration of a normality of autonomy. 
Thus, we can do no more than feed and trust the laws of life as nature gives them to man. In practice, still acted out this holographic medical model through focusing on the dynamics that cross the boundary which defines self from non-self on whatever scale of self-organized unit that might be. The boundary that delineates a tissue type, an organ, a bodily region, or the whole individual. On any of those scales, it's the ratio of inflow versus outflow that then determines the amount of content that is present at any one time within the collection space of that self-organized unit. Think of a bathtub, yeah? The, the flow in the bathtub and then the drain. Still described many varieties of inflows and outflows, but his primary focus was on fluids. It is this ratio of the rate of inflow versus outflow of fluids that determines whether swelling and stagnation occur or deficiency and atrophy or health. This was primarily what Still was referring to when he spoke of the fascia, the interstitial region as a collection space for the fluids that carry the building blocks and fuel for life in and waste products out. Please note that this is also an accurate description of metabolism. Still apply this very same understanding to the innate, the innate defensive capacities of the body. These capacities also require constant appropriate fluid flow if they are to function normally. Beavers. Beavers are renowned for their ability to intentionally create an environment that best provides for their nourishment and defense. This is exactly what pathogens and malignant growths do within their surroundings. They intentionally disrupt the ratio of inflow versus outflow of fluid within the tissue as a means of disabling the host's immune function, while simultaneously thus providing for the nutritive and defensive conditions that then allows them to thrive. And let's take this beaver metaphor one step further. You can poison the beavers, you can cut them out, but their dam and all of its resultant alterations of the dynamics of the hydrology of the landscape will nevertheless remain indefinitely. These are the findings of recent orthodox immunology. The best predictor of the transition from HIV to AIDS is not the pathogen load of the host, but the state of the host's immune function. The pathogens, the pathogens that are the origin of many infectious diseases can be completely eradicated from the host by the immune response, yet the host will nevertheless die as a result of the process of disease that was merely initiated by the pathogen. Orthodox immunology refers to this process as a cytokine storm. Once the disease process gets rolling, if not re-regulated, it becomes an exponential avalanche. This is the mechanism behind sepsis, the leading cause of death worldwide in ICUs. Many, if not most infectious diseases like the 1918 Spanish flu or COVID, even autoimmune disorders. For all of these, it, there's essentially a cytokine storm dynamic. And let me add, from the findings of this research, while COVID-19 may be a novel human pathogen, the pathological process that it, it, that it induces is universally... While COVID-19 may be a novel human pathogen, the pathological process that it induces is universally common. This is to say that often it is not the presence of the pathogen that kills a patient. It's the poor ratio between the damage done to the patient by their own immune response versus the damage done to the pathogen by the immune response. Pathogens and malignant growths intentionally initiate the immunopathology of a cytokine storm within their host just the same as a beaver builds a dam. They both want easy access to their preferred food and a strong defensive capacity. What they do not want is a fair fight because they're very likely to lose it. This picture is how orthodox medicine has historically conceptualized an infectious disease as a castle under siege with the attackers versus the defenders, the pathogen versus the immune system, right? And that's all fine and accurate in its own way, but the model must not end there. Orthodox medical culture has largely overlooked the interior of the castle and the vital roles that are being played inside of it. For example, 
the civilians that are putting out fires from the flaming arrows that are being shot through the windows, or down in the basement where the food stores are being carefully managed and distributed so that the castle can endure an extended siege while it waits for specialized reinforcements to arrive. <clears throat> Putting out a fire before it spreads or rationing food stores is just as vital as killing enemy soldiers, perhaps even more so. These are the types of mechanisms by which osteopathic treatment can effectively and powerfully influence the trajectory of an infectious disease or any other disease process. Every disease condition centrally involves the immune response, inflammation. This is how manual osteopathy holds the potential to effectively prevent or interrupt and re-regulate a cytokine storm, which just so happens to be in exact alignment with Still's understanding of the spread of fermentation as a type of errant chemical reaction that is perpetuated from a highly localized area, exponentially spreading out to consume the whole. The historical orthodox model of infectious disease is very simplistic, pathogen load versus disease resistance. Thus, intervention would logically consist of either killing off the pathogen directly, such as with an antibiotic, or increasing the disease resistance in advance of exposure via vaccination. But a much more nuanced and highly applicable model of infectious disease, in fact, the very one that still was utilizing, understands that there is more than one strategy that can beneficially tip the scales in the patient's favor. We can also seek to increase the ability to tolerate disease, to quickly, effectively, and constantly adapt to the changing conditions, and thereby provide disease resistance and, and immunoregulation, thus avoiding the self-damage that can occur during the immune response. There is a reciprocal relationship between immunoregulation and immune function. Once again, the same pattern emerges. These two have now been recognized by orthodox medical science as but two branches of the very same tree. A stronger regulatory capacity allows for greater offensive efficacy. This was the understanding that informed Still's therapeutic strategy. Still successfully employed this strategy in acute, chronic, even palliative scenarios for the entire spectrum of disease conditions, both to prevent disease and to give comfort to the dying. Still accomplished this by normalizing the flow into and out of specific scales of organization. So to summarize, if disease is best understood as an exponential process of loss of normality, and health is the regenerative outcomes of self-organization, then does it not make sense that a series of appropriately spaced anatomico-physiological renormalizations would not only decrease the rate of self-damage, but increase the rate of repair and decrease the time needed to mount superior defenses, such as the adaptive immune response to a pathogen. And thereby, it would significantly alter the trajectory of the disease process, meaning that in the end, patients receiving osteopathic care not only recover faster, but they are far more likely to recover because they have far less to recover from. Again, all of this was accomplished by still via interaction with the rate of flow in versus flow out, which is to say that still treated immunologically via a normalization of metabolism. And wouldn't you know it, this is the very same newly discovered relationship that is now rocking the Orthodox medical community. Metabolism and immune function are but two sides of the very same coin. A shift in the one dictates the state of the other. The clinical implications are overwhelming. So there is so much that I would love to detail regarding how this acts as an extreme vindication of Still's theory and practice. But as mentioned, this video is an introduction, not an overview of the study. We have not addressed all of the major findings of the study. You can look to the full paper for those. But for now, let's talk about one important and highly relevant osteopathic clinical application that this all points to. During the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, an osteopath in Kirksville, Anne Howes, reported that her patients required six treatments per 24 hour period for the first three days of their illness. So that is 18 treatments in 72 hours for this serious acute condition. The historical data would suggest that these treatments probably only lasted around 10 minutes, give or take. 
as one key informant of this uh, study that I conducted, summarized in, uh, in his synthesis that he had arrived at by sifting through all of the historical osteopathic literature related to the treatment of pneumonia. He said, the more severe it was, the more frequently they treated it, but the less amount of time they used to treat it. That was Dr. Brian Dagenhart. Or as an, another example from the past, still is reported to have successfully treated the abnormal growths in the eyelids and eyes of Margaret Hildreth that were slowly blinding her. Still works with her once a week for two years straight. That's 104 weekly treatments in a row. Or take the article that Still wrote for prospective patients of his Kirksville Infirmary, informing these prospective patients that, for example, in the case of asthma, they should expect that, quote, 75% of cases are curable in from two to four months, end quote, while the remaining 25% of patients should expect even longer to reach resolution of their condition. We can explicate from historically, we can historically, oh boy, from the historical literature, we can explicate that this would have been at uh, the most common dosage of one to three treatments per week. Again, usually only 10 to 20 minutes duration per treatment. All of these examples are radically different in their format and their scope of practice from the modern methodology that I was introduced to within my own recent osteopathic education. All of these examples fo focus specifically on consistently repeated dosage as a prerequisite for successful intervention. Both historical and modern osteopathic literature suggests that shorter, more frequent treatments, often provided over a longer timeline, would usually be in more line with our patient's biological requirements. There is much more in the full study regarding how and why this treatment framework was put into place, how it was tailored to the specific circumstances of each individual patient, and why it makes the most sense physiologically. But for now, how might this historical framework be implemented today in clinical practice? Firstly, we need to begin with incorporating awareness of it into modern osteopathic education. Osteopaths must learn that as much as possible, frequency and duration of treatment must be determined by biological factors, not socioeconomic ones. If this is not done, the very framework of treatment itself will continue to be the limiting factor in both clinical results and scope of practice. If you're an osteopath who tends to treat within longer individual sessions, I'm not suggesting that you abandon that, but I am suggesting that you at least explore these theories for yourself. Perhaps experiments with 30 minute sessions could, conducted with family and friends. So that would be 30 minutes for intake assessment and total treatment. And afterwards, and this is the key, see that patient again soon, within a day or two, if only to simply reassess them you'll likely be shocked at how much of the, of the issues that you didn't have time to work with just a day or two before have now already shifted back to normality. Experiencing this for oneself not only increases trust in the self-corrective ability of the patient, but also leaves you with a more diverse skill set, ready, <clears throat> ready to provide care within a much wider array of scenarios. At the very least, while continuing to work within your current framework, you'll gain greater efficacy through greater efficiency. But let's say that Still had discovered antibiotics instead of osteopathy, and that he had then suggested that antibiotics be dosed three times per day, every day for three weeks straight. Modern osteopathic practice would often be dosing something along the lines of a single triple dose once a week. Why then are we so surprised that today we're not getting the same level of results as still in the early osteopaths? We may be using the very same tools, but we are not using the same approach that they did. From this perspective, it's useful to look at frequency of treatment, like operating one of those old hand water pumps. Yes, you have to have a minimum efficiency of each stroke with each stroke of the pump, but once that's achieved, what really matters so much more is how often you pump and how long you keep pumping. That determines whether you get water or not. Oh. So clinically, this is perhaps the single most relevant and easily applied finding of this research, which is why I chose to convey it within the constraints, constraints of this video. As one of the early important osteopaths, Carl McConnell put it, 
Timing and spacing of treatments are too often based on fancy of some sort and not on therapeutic requirements. Probably more failures and dissatisfaction in osteopathy arise here than from all other sources combined. Success is dependent upon this as well as upon definite structural corrections. It seems in modern osteopathy, we spend a lot of time acknowledging that our interventions must be incredibly precise and accurate. Does it not then also follow that the frequency with which those interventions are implemented is of at least as much importance? If the individual that we are seeking to aid is perceived as a process rather than an object, this would certainly seem to be the case. This is a picture of still pear climbing a pear tree. Perhaps the modern osteopathic community does not need a new fancy technique nearly so much as we need to implement more appropriate frequency of treatment. We need to pick the low hanging fruit first, then go through all the effort of climbing to the top of the tree so we can get that last elusive pear. In conclusion, there have been so many recent exciting advances made within orthodox medical research. Just some of the ones relevant uh, to this topic that were addressed within the study, but that we didn't have time to fully explore within this video were immunotherapy, mechanotransduction now being recognized as a means of both cancer genesis and a potential treatment for it, immunometabolism as a new and fundamental field within biology itself, the central importance of immunoregulation and disease tolerance in dictating clinical outcomes, and the role that anatomically compartmentalized microcirculatory abnorm abnormalities play in initiating and allowing the perpetuation of cytokine storms. Each of these cases can be understood as instances of the structure function relationship that is a foundation of Still's osteopathy. In many of these papers, the orthodox researchers would conclude by more or less stating, if only we can now figure out a way to enact, to apply these new theoretical understandings that we've arrived at, the clinical results would be revolutionary. And this is what most impressed me about Still's work from the late 1800s. Not only did he come to a theoretical comprehension of these principles, but he successfully innovated an effective means of applying them. Yet modern osteopathy seems to be moving further and further away from Still's original vision. Given this, while it's extremely useful to understand osteopathy more deeply through the scientific method, the vindication of Still's historical immunological understanding points to the fact that today's osteopathic profession must not rely on evidence-based practices alone. Not unless we wish to wait another 140 years for orthodox validation of the methods that we can employ in service of our communities right now. The fruit is hanging very low. Let's not let it rot on the branch.